Great to be here. And we are using the month of January to talk about vision. It's the year 2020. Uh, so we are using this idea of 2020 vision, having clarity about what God has called us to do as a church and trusting that we will pursue that calling with greater intentionality. The vision of our church is to make disciples, to plant and strengthen churches, leading to transformation, transformed lives, transformed communities. And last week, if you were here, you'll recall that we looked at the great commission that was given by our Lord Jesus Christ after His resurrection. And we saw what it means to make disciples. And, and one of the things we saw is that all disciples of Jesus should be involved in making other disciples of Jesus. Out of His great authority, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. And we are to baptize these disciples in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we are to teach them to obey everything that our Lord Jesus has commanded. Yesterday we had a great time of being equipped in the area of evangelism, which is a piece of making disciples, and we learned some uh, really cool move, hand motions. Um, if I can recall, go. Josiah, you were there. You're helping me here. Go make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey. Yeah, we, we felt that last part could have been maybe a bit harsh. You must obey, but that was kind of like the best thing that we could uh, come up with at the moment. Today we're looking at planting and strengthening churches. And there's actually a connection between making disciples and planting churches. The Bible shows us that the planting of churches is the outcome of making disciples. If we are faithful in making disciples, then we will see churches being planted. Jesus said that he would build his church. That sounds like a church planting statement. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm thinking, how's Jesus going to build his church? Well, after Matthew 28, where he says, go and make disciples, what we then see in, in, in the book of Acts and in the letters is we see churches, that the outcome of making disciples was that churches were established. Churches were planted and churches were strengthened. Mark Dever, in his book, Understanding the Great Commission, says this, the Great Commission is normally fulfilled through planting and growing local churches. So the Great Commission involves you, the individual Christian, but the Great Commission also involves you through your local church. That is the normal way God means for us to go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. We'll be in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 16, and we'll be looking at the church in Philippi. Sode made reference to um, Philippians chapter 2 earlier on. So we're looking at this church and we're going to see the way in which this church was planted. There's no one way to plant a church, but this is a way that we see in the Bible that a church was 
established and we can learn many good things from this. So reading from verses 6 to 12, it says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace. And the next day, we went on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of the district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. So the first observation that we can make here is God was active in leading Paul and his companions. At that time, the Holy Spirit was not ready for the gospel to be preached in Asia. So the Holy Spirit says, "Mm -mm, you're not going there. Mm -mm, You're not going into Bithynia, but God did have a plan for their next steps. He led them through a vision that Paul saw, and the next destination was this place called Macedonia, which is in the north of present-day Greece. And at that time, it was a Roman colony, so the gospel was on its way to Europe. And at once, they left There was no delay in going to Macedonia. This is what God has said. This is the direction He's given us. We must go at once and make disciples. Let's go there and proclaim the gospel. Let's go there and fulfill the Great Commission. Carrying on, verses 13 to 15. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. The language changes from Paul and his companions to we and us. It's, it's Luke that's writing, and by now he's, he's joined the team. And thinking from a Jewish perspective, they had the Sabbath day in mind. They were hoping to find a place of prayer, perhaps a synagogue, a strategy that Paul had used repeatedly up until now was to go into synagogues and proclaim the gospel, starting with his own people, the Jews. There was some common ground there with them as he proclaimed God and proclaimed Jesus as the one who came to die and be raised from the dead for our sins. But there was no synagogue there, which means the Jewish presence must have been quite small because the, the experts tell us that you needed at least 10 Jewish men in order to set up a synagogue. So they end up at this place of prayer by the river, and there was a group of women that had gathered there. And one of those women is Lydia. And Lydia was a business woman. She dealt in purple cloth. She came from Thyatira, found in Asia. 
and she was a worshiper of God. She worshiped God, but she did not follow Jesus. She was religious, but she was not a Christian. You can be religious and not be a Christian. And, and we have many people like that in Dar es Salaam. And maybe even in this room, maybe you are religious, but you're not really following Jesus. She did believe in the God of the Bible, but she did not have a relationship with Jesus. But there's still this common ground of her being a worshiper. And when Paul proclaims the gospel, we read there that God opened her heart to respond to his message. When people respond to the gospel, to this incredible message that we are all sinners and we need to be saved and that salvation comes only through Jesus Christ and through no other way, through his death on the cross, through his burial and his resurrection and by putting faith in him, that's the only way to be saved. When people respond to that message, it's because God has opened their hearts. It's a work of God. But at the same time, people make a choice. They have to choose. They have to decide. I've heard the message. Now what will I do with it? So she responds and she accepts this message because God had opened her heart. Someone had to tell them the message. Paul had to share. People don't hear and make a decision without someone telling them that this is what you are to believe. Lydia and all the members of her household were baptized. So at some point, the members of her household, and households in those days were more than your, just you, you and your family. It, it, it could include, you know, your servants, you know, people that were connected to you that lived in this, in this household. So it says that her whole household were baptized, which means at some point the whole household must have heard the gospel and made a decision to follow Jesus because as we recall from last week, Jesus said, go and make disciples, baptizing them. So they, they, they need to be disciples first before the baptism comes. So this household has come to faith in Christ and then they are baptized. And she convinced Paul and his companions to come and stay at her house. So there's now a household. There's now a, a household in Philippi that, that follows Jesus Christ. And, and perhaps she was quite a successful uh, businesswoman if she could have a household where she could also invite Paul and his team and say, hey, come and, you know, come and stay over. Awesome. Praise God. First Christians in Philippi. And, and, and then Paul and, and his team, they go and they, they're in her house. They, they, they connect with them. And, and, you know, even talking about life groups, which happen in houses, which happen in homes, community, relationship. Carrying on, verses 16 to 18. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. And she earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. 
She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. Having experienced faithful ministry at the place of prayer, they decide to go back. That's a good strategy for doing God's work. You know, we, we, we tried that and we had some fruit there. Well, let's, let's go back. We found a person of peace. Remember we spoke about people of peace some time ago. Well, here's this person that God is using to, to be like a doorway, a, a way into the community uh, for the gospel. So they go back. Now, when they go back, they run into this demon-possessed girl, slave girl. And this demon-possessed slave girl is saying, these are servants of the Most High. And they're telling you the way to be saved. Demons know the gospel. Demons recognize those who are doing God's work. And here is this demon-possessed girl saying, hey, look at these guys. And after days of that, Paul gets annoyed. It's a distraction. And he commands that demon out. And she's set free. And who knows, maybe this young woman, this girl, becomes a founding member of this church as well. We're not told that, but it's possible that after she was set free, and we heard this morning as, as, as Carl was speaking about how Jesus has come to set captives free, she was set free. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says this, though her statements were true, the gospel of Christ would be damaged by an association with the demon-possessed slave girl. So after many days, Paul exercised the demon, speaking directly to the spirit. There is spiritual warfare in the work of spreading the gospel, in the work of making disciples, in the work of planting churches. There is spiritual warfare. The devil and his demons are out to derail us. They are out to fight against the Great Commission. The Great Commission is a war. It's a battle. Jesus said, I will build my church. Praise God! And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. That's a st statement of spiritual warfare. I'm building my church, but the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, the authorities of hell are standing against us. They will oppose us, but Jesus is saying they will not prevail. The kingdom will advance in the power of the Spirit. The gospel will go forward in the power of the Spirit. Dear friends, we, we need to be ready to pray for people to be set free, to be delivered from the works of the devil. We need to be ready to, 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 to pray and to fast and to, and, and, to, and to read scripture and to fight against the works of the devil as we advance God's purposes. Carrying on from verse 19. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. It's gone from here. Now it's, 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 it's escalating. 
They joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Paul and Silas faced great trouble from the people of Philippi. They were dragged into the marketplace because they had put an end to the the good income that these guys were making from that demon-possessed slave girl. They were brought before the magistrates. The city was turned upside down. They were stripped. They were severely flogged. And they ended up in the most secure part of prison. Friends, is, is this what we think of when we think of preaching the gospel? I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to go and make some disciples. I'm going to be involved in church planting. What, what comes to your mind as you think of those things? Do you ever think that you could be stripped, flogged, thrown in prison for serving God? And could it be that, that one of the reasons why we, we don't see more of us on the front foot for the kingdom of God is because we read the Bible, we do the math, and we're like, mm-mm, I, I don't want that. There's the possibility that those things could happen to me. I'm going to live a comfortable no conflict, no confrontation, Christianity, because I actually don't want those things to happen. Well, those things could happen to any one of us if we say, I, I want to be used by God to make disciples. I want to use, be used by God to see His kingdom go forward. Perhaps there's too much in the Christian message today that makes Christianity look so comfortable and easy. And and, and Christianity sometimes is made to look like one giant slot machine where you just keep getting stuff out. Yeah, God wants to bless us, but there's also this reality that Christianity can be a place of persecution, difficulty, challenge, pain. From verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. What? You you guys have just been flogged and you're singing to this God of yours, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Paul and Silas' response is challenging. It is remarkable. How do you respond this way, it's, it's, it's unexpected praying and, and singing hymns when you are going through such a difficult time. As you are going through difficult times for your faith, how are you responding? How are we responding? It is one of our responses to... Pray and sing hymns. Yesterday, on, on my way home, 
um, we have a really, we have some really bad roads to our house. Some of you have been to our house. You know what I'm talking about. Um, I got stuck. And maybe about 40 minutes to an hour later after many hands had come to try and help, uh, ev eventually got unstuck. And, and when I got home, I was like, man, you know, I said to Trudy, I said, it's hard. It's hard to live here. My, my response, and, and I'd, had, I'd had a great day getting trained about evangelism, um, meeting with someone else who's getting married that we've already announced, so that's not a new announcement. And I was just like, I've had a good day, but it's, it's not ending well. And that was my response. That was, it's complaining, moaning. And, and often, as, as we are living the Christian life, we, we don't respond like, man, praise God, I've got, I've got whip marks on my back, my feet are fastened in chains, praise God, I'm going to lift up His name, I'm going to pray. Do we respond like that? I just want to encourage us, guys, to let's trust God for a more robust faith. Like, man, God, make us, make us stronger in the face of adversity. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now that's an incredible question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Where did that question come from? Possibly, he may have known that these guys ended up here through a chain of events that started with a slave girl that was saying, these guys are telling you the way to be saved. And he sees all this stuff happening, and he's like, man, these guys must be the real deal. Sirs, the place is shaking, chains have fallen. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. The answer that they gave him was that he and his household will be saved by believing in the Lord Jesus. And then he and his household heard the word of the Lord. They, they actually heard the message of the gospel. Jesus Christ is the way to salvation. Believe in him and you will be saved. Your sins will be forgiven and you will have eternal life. People can only be saved if they hear the gospel and believe the gospel. And after hearing the gospel, the jailer responds with kindness. He washes their wounds. Then he and his household were baptized immediately. They put their faith in Christ, and immediately they respond in baptism. Baptism, which is a symbol of us dying with Christ and rising with Christ. They're baptized. And then the jailer shows them further kindness by bringing them into his house and giving them a meal. He feeds them. And he was full of joy because he and his household had come to believe in God. So there's now a second household in Philippi that received the gospel and got baptized. We've got Lydia's household. We've got this other guy, the jailer. He's also like a, a man of peace. You know, the gospel is, is entering the city through him and his household. A church is being formed. 
and perhaps the slave girl as well. And, and by the, the, the time this chapter ends, as, as Paul and, and Tim are leaving, they go to Lydia's house and there's a church meeting in her house. The church has been established through the preaching of the gospel, through the obedience to the Great Commission. And off they go to the next place. But friends, it, it actually doesn't end there. And let's trust God that even in Dar es Salaam, that there are households, there are families that God can lead us to, that can be the start, the foundation of new churches. Households that God can connect us with, that they can respond to the gospel and, and say yes, and, and yes, we are believing in Christ and we're going to get baptized and churches are being established. And, and, and you know some of those households. You're connected to them. If you, and, and if you're not aware of who they are just yet, well, let's ask God to show us. God direct us. It does not end there, friends. About 10 years later, Paul wrote to the Philippians. And uh, interestingly, he's in prison in Rome this time. And a theme running through this letter is, is joy. You'll recall that the jailer was full of joy because he and his family, he and his household had come to believe in God. And Paul's letter shows us that the Philippian church was a church that was involved in church planting and church strengthening. They took the Great Commission seriously. They helped to see the gospel go forward. They helped to see other churches established. In chapter 1, verses 3 to 6, Paul writing to them, he says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And if the jailer was, was listening to those words, he might be thinking, he's, he's in prison again? Things are going to happen again. He's thanking God in prison again. Paul was grateful for the Philippians. When he prayed for them, he had joy. They were his partners in the gospel from the first day. And over a 10-year period, they worked with Paul to spread the gospel. They participated, that partnership, it's they participated, they shared in what he was doing. And a specific thing that Paul mentions in their partnership is that they gave financially to enable him to spread the gospel. In fact, that was one of the the key things in this letter was, guys, you, 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 you've given money <laughs> to the ministry. You've given money to help churches get planted, to help disciples get made. In chapter 4, verse 15 to 16, Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when you were starting to get to know the gospel, the good news of Jesus being given, God giving His very best, as you were getting acquainted with that amazing reality when I set out from Macedonia, not one church, so they are a church, shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Now, if we, if we read on to Acts chapter 17, we see that Paul ends up in Thessalonica, and he preaches the gospel there. And as the gospel is preached there, another church is birthed there. 
And he's saying, guys, when I left you and we went to Thessalonica and we preached the gospel and the church was birthed there, you guys were in it with us. You were supporting us financially. You were giving money to make this happen. Disciples of Jesus were made there. A church was established there. And when I think of, of our church, next slide please, we are part of a movement of churches partnering together to advance the gospel through planting and strengthening churches. We're part of advance. So what we're doing here is part of something bigger. And one of the things I would love us to do as a church is to get to a place where we can give even more money, be even more generous to the worldwide work of advance in church planting. Not just for Dar es Salaam and Tanzania, but we're, we're a global family of churches. And even this morning, our sister church in Nairobi, I think they're praying for us because I got an email, please send your, 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 your logo. They're, they're, they're remembering us in their prayers as well. As we come to a close, we should be excited about the churches that are yet to be planted. We should be asking God for direction. God, if you're closing that door, open the one that is right for us. We should be intentional about seeing the Great Commission fulfilled. We should be going out and making disciples and seeing those disciples formed into churches. We should be trusting God for church planters that from this group here and others who may not be here, God would raise up church planters disciple makers who will then see communities of faith develop that will then continue the work of making disciples and seeing churches planted. And we should be doing all that we can to be a church that is planting churches and strengthening churches even in the face of adversity, in the face of an enemy, in the face of trials and tribulations. The gospel goes forward with much tribulation. The kingdom of God advances with much tribulation. And we should be trusting that God will use this community to multiply churches across our city, our nation, and to the ends of the earth. That is what biblical Christianity is, dear friends. Shall we stand? I'd like you where you are. If you're a follower of Jesus, let's lift our voices together and ask God for direction. Ask God for church planters. Ask God for vision for this, ask God for his help to make disciples. Thank you, Lord. And if you are not yet a follower of Jesus, if you have not yet received the gospel of Jesus, as we close, us leaders will be here at the front. Come and talk to us about that. We would love to help you come to a place where you can also say, you know what, I have also put my faith in Jesus Christ. I follow Jesus. Shall we do that? God bless you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday.